my name is Dean Airy. I'm from McLavick. Camp at Shingle Point, and then we like me and my wife, and then we, we got Jordan, my son-in-law Cody, Nellie, and Dennis Airy, and all them will share a whale and with Shingle Point. I'm Mary Ruth Mew from McLavick NWT. My parents were here. We used to either be at Herschel Island or Running River, but today I'm at Shingle Point. That's where my camp is today, so. My name is Clara Day. I'm from Inuvik. I'm uh, 65 years old. I used to be an Inuvalectun teacher. Used to be, I taught Inuvalectun for 10 years, retired, and then moved to my bush camp for five years. And my Inuvalawit culture means everything. It identifies me. Oceans are very important to us, not only for whales, but for fish and other species that we harvest that. We need that food in our bodies to live. It's uh, actually part of our tradition, and it's part of uh, what we utilize for our food. It's a really important source of uh, food that we, we eat. Hi, I'm Jim Elias. I'm from Born and raised in Tuktoya Tuk, and that's where I reside. When I was a young boy, I used to go out with my friends, tag along with them out when they're out harvesting blue whales and that. That's where I had my first experience of, of uh, harvesting a blue whale. Since I was about 13, 14 years old, I started going out with older friends and that, tagging along. and they'll leave it overnight to let it dry, the skin dry, and they'll cut off the top layer. They'll take off the top layer, and then after they do that, they'll cut them to squares and they'll all be hanging in a stage. And then they'll wash them and clean them up, clean all the, try to take all the blood out and take all the shot, shot of pieces off. And then they'll cut half the blubber off, because the blubber is probably about that thick. They'll cut half it off and they'll make strips work with them, cut them into strips and throw them into a big pail and now that'll make oil. And you'll cook it slow simmer, like a slow simmer for at least two hours you cook them up to minimum, just slow cook it. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and that's when it's the best. And after you finish cooking it then you'll take them out of the pot and you'll have a like a stage on the ground of wood. You use wood all the time, logs, and you put them all close together. And then you put the blubber down after all the water drains out of it. And then you'd, you'd have a big, like a pail with all the blubber, you'll start, put a little bit of blubber in a five gallon, then you'll put muktuk, a little more blubber. And that's what preserves the muktuk is the blubber, that's what keeps it, keeps it good. After you're done with that, then you put it in a cool place, you know, you always have a, in a five gallon, and you'd have a hole on top of the five gallon, that way, got air to come out and once you bring it into town then you put it in a deep freezer right away and put it away and you'll have muktuk for all winter. Be careful when you um, work with oil, especially in the arms and the flippers when you're gonna use that for raw muktuk it's called wheelak. When we butchered we'll cut it in slabs and we'll have a pail of water here. We'll have to put so much in there, we'll squeeze all that blood out. Try to squeeze as much blood out as you can. And you're just gonna do that just to the flipper and the arms. And you're gonna lay it in cloth, a canvas, and cover it so there's no flies can get in it. And you're, you're gonna keep turning it until you're ready to put it in the ochrok. When you're gonna make Gilly duck, dry meat. You take the meat, meat off of the back strap. Next day you'll cut it into strips and hang it, but you have to watch it, um, like turn it over. You look through it, there's no um, flies and make any worms. You, If there's any, then you'll cut it off and then continue to dry. And we don't dry ours dry, dry. It's like half dry, then we start putting it in a pail.
Um, well, beluga was always part of my diet. I always go out there and harvest my makdak for the winter. And then still pass on a tradition, like when I let my son get his first beluga whale, we gave out that whole, it's basically his whole beluga whale to all the elders and people, single parents and ones that couldn't hunt. Part of the tradition in the back, back in those days, I guess, where you get your first, first whale, you give it out to the community, and that's what I let Jesse do. We don't kill as many whales as we used to do, and that's one of the reasons because the kids don't hardly, the kids don't hardly ever eat the muktuk now. Yeah, back in the 80s and 70s, you'd see tuck, tuck alone, we usually get over 100 and some 140 whales basically a year. Now tuck's lucky to get maybe 40 or 50 on a, on a high level. Mm -hmm. So our, our whales, hunting, harvesting our whales has declined quite a bit. And you always make sure you use a, the right caliber for a whale. Kill the whale that's by the blowhole, that's where the whale usually die right there. A lot of guys use 30-30, I like 30-30 also. And anything with a 180 grain bullet or higher I'd, I'd use for for um, harvesting the whale. Like a 308 or 270, 30-06. But a lot of guys prefer the 30-30, it's a close shooting gun. It was one of my concerns was that they're coming in earlier and then there seems like they're calving earlier, they're having calves earlier. Could be some, could affect the whales because maybe they're being born premature. They're coming in like um, like first week of June and that, and as ice opened up, they could come into the Kitigazuit area and that's when we'd go out. Now the ice goes out so early, the whales come in earlier. And when they're coming in earlier now, we notice a lot of the harvesters, myself, we notice that the first whale that's coming in there, a little bit, the blubber is pretty, uh, not as thick as when you get them in like middle of July. The blubber is a lot thicker than the, than the first ones come, so it's, I wish I get my whale closer to end of July. Spring is always practice her pulling, and now it's finally old enough. And Big enough to her when I was 12 years old. And it was pretty fun watching the wave for the whale. And it was pretty windy too on that mm -hmm. day. But we were able, I was able to see the wave because we used to check, we used to turn, make a turn towards the wind. And, uh, it was hard to keep my balance because I was learning how to keep my balance in the boat uh, to harpoon. And Just like all the other animals that we harvest, we harvest them for a reason, you know, to survive. And also to pass our tradition to younger people and how to prepare our, the food. It makes me feel really good, I, you know, it makes me feel that I'm teaching him something that I was taught, and I'm, I'm glad he respect how he, uh, when he goes hunting, respects the animal, for sure. And not only that, a lot of the food Anthony harvests, he gives it away to. You really get blessed when you do that. And he's gonna find out, I think, because uh, my dad sent me to a clavic when I was pretty young to hunt. And I gave a lot of caribou away in a clavic through the years in the 60s, you know, when caribou first went there. I went to a clavic the other day and I got some caribou from somebody, just out of the blue, you know. Mm -hmm. So it sort of, you sort of get it back. I have four daughters, nine grandchildren, four great-grandchildren. Most of the time we raised them at the bush camp. To me, that's home. That's my home. I love being out there. You're free as a bird. You have no time, no TV, no phones. And the kids love it because they're free to do everything. If I could, I'd stay there all year long. <laughs> it was really important that they know how to survive out there. Um, and I'm so thankful for that because now that they're older and have children, they can teach their children to survive on the land.
When they're at the whaling camp, they really want to learn hands-on. And that's what we're teaching all the grandchildren. Long ago, we didn't do that. There were there was too many adults down at the whaling camps. Like there used to be about 10 to 15 families down there and a lot of adults. So the kids couldn't work with them. They'd be on the way. We're really lucky now. Yeah. And how we learned when we were small is by watching. Yeah. And they talk in Inabalifton and tell us. But this works better when they have the hands on. So it's something for them, especially when they go back to school, they have something to talk about.